Okay. And um, we are going to be doing wild and crazy stuff tonight. After this. <laughs> but the wildest and craziest stuff. Like wildest and craziest stuff was in the 16th and 17th centuries. Let me share the screen just so that we can have at least an outline of the uh, basic points that we're going to be focusing on. And you'll see that on the board. But what you see on the board is this. And this is done. And everyone should now see from Ruyak Kabbalah to Shabbatai Tzvi. Everyone have the text? Yep. Yes. Yep. Thumbs up for the text. Let's do a little bit of a perspective before we uh, go on. We had Jesus of Nazareth. Um, I, can't get, I can't get into the I can't get into the Google Docs. You have to prove um, access. I gave I gave everyone everyone who has the link has access, but you can also see it on the share screen. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Either way. Um. Yes. So Jesus of Nazareth, or at least his uh, followers, they changed the world. But the Jews went on. The Jews went on with bunches and bunches of messianic figures. But it is clear that a messianic figure who's really highly influential, who literally moves millions of lives. Bar Kochba was like that, for better or for worse, talked about. And Shabbat Tzvi is the same. Shabbat Tzvi moved millions of Jews around the world, from Yemen to Poland and Lithuania and Ukraine, from, from one end of the world to the other. Okay, and there was no other Messiah like this from Bar Kokhba until Shabtai Tzvi. If you go, I don't know, fool around on the internet and look for names of Jewish Messiahs, you'll get a pretty good list of names between Bar Kokhba and Shabtai Tzvi, including the uh, fellow that we did last week, Avraham Abulafia. Okay, but none of these people moved millions of Jews. None of these people impacted the uh, Jewish world. The, the most we can say about uh, Avraham Abulafia, which makes him you know, a little bit famous or makes him a little bit important, is that he was the first context in which Kabbalah became controversial, right? We talked about this last week. Before him, it was a secret. So even if it was revolutionary, nobody cared because it was a secret. He tried to spread it to the masses and he tried to declare himself the Messiah to the Pope of Rome. And when you go public like that, you create some waves. And he did create some waves. But can we really say that he changed history? The answer is probably uh, a pretty firm no. He didn't, I mean, he's interesting. He's colorful. He probably created a lot of gossip and a bit of controversy uh, uh, during his lifetime. But to say that he moved history or that he touched millions and millions of hearts or lives, that you cannot say about Abraham Abu Lafia, even though he went public. And all the more so for all of the various names of messiahs that you could name if you wanted to from Bar Kokhba until uh, until Shabbat Tzvi. None of them were really that important on a, on a mass level or on a level that, that, that created waves that lasted for, for generations uh, upon generation. None of them were anything, were anything like that. Shabbat Tzvi was. However, Shabbat Tzvi was that way or had that kind of influence, not first and foremost, just because of himself, okay? 
there are ways in which he is a person or some of the people around him worked to make huge waves in the Jewish world and even succeeded, okay? I'm not saying it's entirely disconnected to his personality or to his life, it's not. His life and his personality are very important and we're gonna do them, okay? And yet he was riding on a, uh, on a much bigger wave, okay? There was a wave that began before him. And I guess you could, you know, if you want to give a, a California uh, a metaphor for this, right? He's like the guy on the surfboard riding the big wave, okay? Without the wave, you couldn't do anything. Now you need the guy and you need the surfboard, okay? But the wave is what gives it power. And the wave that he and his, and his advisors and his followers rode upon was a wave in Jewish thought, which can be described in exactly the way I described Sabbatianism a moment ago. I said that it touched the hearts and lives of Jews, Sabbatianism, from one end of the Jewish world to the other, from Yemen to Iraq, to Persia, to Syria, to Eretz Israel, throughout North Africa, and then up into Europe, Germany, Poland, Lithuania, Ukraine, the, the Western areas of the, of the Russian Empire, okay? Vast distances and vast uh, 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 changes or differences in, in culture. That, it's true that Shabtai Tzvi had an impact in all of these places, but it's also true that he was carried on a great wave that reached all of these places before him. And that wave was Lurianic Kabbalah, okay? To have some idea of what Lurianic Kabbalah is and what its potentialities are in order to give rise to something like Shabtai Tzvi or to go back to the metaphor, what makes a wave so powerful that it can carry the surfer? So we'll first of all briefly compare it to the Kabbalah that we did before. The Kabbalah that we did before, as you see in the list here, number one, is the 13th century Kabbalah of Spain. Okay, we can call it the, the Spanish Kabbalah, even though it's also from a Provence. But the most important uh, creations and the most important leaders uh, uh, were in Spain, the Ramban and the, uh, and the appearance in whatever manner, we talked about it already, of the Zohar, and even a, a strange and interesting and colorful figure like Abraham Abulafia was, at least in his roots, he was uh, Spanish. So this is the 13th century Kabbalah, and we already saw, without going into detail, that on the one hand, it was hyper-conservative. It, it, it gave great meaning to every detail of the way the Jews are supposed to live and keep the commandments. And yet within it, there were, there were potentialities for, uh, for radical developments, okay? And Avraham Abulafia was an early indication that some of these ideas can be taken in very different directions and mystical experiences can be had in very different ways than say the authors of the, uh, of the Zohar uh, uh, would have had them or, or the kinds of things that uh, the Ramban for one would have, um, would have uh, looked at with favor. Now, what happened from the 13th century to the 16th century? In terms of the Kabbalah itself, you see in number two that we have transmission and commentary basic development in the centuries to come. We're talking about a period of three centuries, okay? Three centuries in which Kabbalah remains more or less the same thing that we already talked about. The same ideas about, you know, what it says about God, what it says about the Torah, what it says about the mitzvot, the kinds of things we discussed in the last uh, couple of classes. This goes on. We have the Zohar, so for three, Zohar 
they copy the Zohar, they comment on the Zohar, they, 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 they maybe quote the Zohar in, in various other contexts and use it in various ways. This is a period of transmission, commentary and development, but the basic ideas remain basically more or less the same. Alongside the transmission and commentary, as all of you, uh, as all of you know, there were also great events for the Jews of Spain before we get to the 16th century. Okay? The two big events were 1391, where there was a huge persecution of the Jews of Spain, and many Jews were murdered, many were forcibly converted to uh, Christianity, and the great many fled to various other places, most prominently to North Africa, which is, uh, which is very close. And this is the beginning of what we call the uh, Sephardic diaspora, okay? You know, we have Jews nowadays from all over the world who are colloquially called Sephardim. And, you know, it might even seem a little bit strange, a Jew from Syria, why would you call him Sephardi, Spanish? Or a Jew from Algeria, why would you call him Sephardi, Spanish? There is a reason, and the reason is, is that uh, refugees from Spain beginning in 1391 brought Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, Torah and Spanish customs, Spanish tradition to all of these new places, including the Zohar and including the, uh, including the uh, Kabbalah. So that was 1391. Then of course, a century later, we have 1492. Okay, you see that here in number uh, four, that in 14 number 92, the Jews are finally, and, uh, and uh, with, 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 you know, putting an end to the process, the Jews are expelled from Spain. And a few years later, they're also expelled from Portugal. The Iberian Peninsula rids itself of Jews. And these Jews go all around the world Spanish Jewry is now a population that is looking for redemption. It was always looking for redemption, even when they were in Spain. But now there was such a cataclysm, there was such a disaster that this rich culture that existed and thrived for so many centuries had its door completely closed, okay? And this is a time where Jews begin to do two complementary things, okay? Not just in the wake of 1492. This happens at other junctures of Jewish history as well, okay? But usually after a big disaster, a big calamity, Jews try to do two parallel things. The two parallel things the Jews try to, try to do may sound uh, contradictory, because one is it's kind of like the Kabbalah itself. One is conservative and the other is um, radical, okay? The conservative thing the Jews try to do in the wake of calamity is to conserve the tradition which has now been cut, which has now been severed, okay? Spanish Jewry has come to an end so the Spanish exiles now want to make an effort to conserve the tradition of Spanish Jews, centuries and centuries of, of learning and practice and, and culture and creation. They want to preserve this. The result of this desire to conserve is something that all of you know about without exception. And that is a very <coughs> book of Jewish law called the Shulchan Aruch by Rabbi Yosef Karo in the 16th century, who was in exile from Spain. Okay, why does Rabbi Yosef Karo write uh, his, real, his really important war, war work is the, uh, the Beit Yosef on the tour where he sums up centuries and centuries of Torah scholarship and then he sums all of that and then he, he condenses that in like a Reader's Digest version but not quite as entertaining. 
in the uh, in the Shulchan Aruch. Why does Rabbi Yosef Karo do this? Because the tradition of Torah study in Spain has now come to an end, and so that it will be preserved, it needs to be uh, it needs to be written down and and summarized and. And, and put into permanent form in this magnum opus, the uh, Beit Yosef on the tour, and its uh, summary points in the uh, Shulchan Aruch. So that is the one side. That is the conservative um, reaction of Jews to the um, to the um, to the uh, destruction of uh, Jewish life in Spain. But there is also the radical reaction. Okay, what is the radical reaction? It has to do with Kabbalah. These exiles from Spain, the, the greatest names among them, they were Kabbalists. Rabbi Yosef Karo, you probably all know from your tours in Israel, settled in Tzfat, right? Many of the uh, Spanish Jews who were exiled uh, settled in, settled in uh, Tzfat. It was a unique culture in Sfat. And these people are also Kabbalists. But here, but here's where the radicalism comes in. Okay? You, about Kabbalah. In other words, you could go like back up to number two, and you could just continue the transmission and commentary on the Zohar that's been going on for, uh, for a few centuries already. Right? There, there's, there, you know, you could just keep on doing that. But that's not what happened. Instead, in Tzfat, Kabbalah undergoes a radical transformation in the 16th century, which has much to do with the exile of the Jews from Spain, but also to other Jewish calamities. Okay. Now, I said that this kind of thing, that you have a double Jewish reaction, which on the one hand is conservative, and on the other hand is radical, happened in other times. I'll give a quick uh, example from modern times, okay? The Holocaust, okay? The, the, the greatest centers of Jewish life and learning were, 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 were murdered and destroyed. And the survivors for whom that world of, uh, of, uh, of learning and uh, practice was important, they began to move towards codification, okay? One, one uh, out, out, what's the word I'm looking for? One outgrowth, a very minor outgrowth, but, but an outgrowth nonetheless of the, of the Holocaust and the destruction of European Jewry was codifications of Jewish law, okay? In the generation or two after the Holocaust, you begin to have, instead of like having like a Shulchan Aruch and a Rambam and a Tur, which maybe take up one book, big, big bookshelf, you have endless tomes being written in, on, on, on halachot. You'll have multi-volume works on a single Jewish law, okay? Whether it's the law of this or the law of that, the laws of Shabbat or the laws of Pesach or uh, the laws of women covering their hair or the laws of not having bugs in your lettuce, okay? This kind of codification is something that happens when Jewish culture is destroyed, okay? Before the Holocaust, why did no Jewish mother in her kitchen search for bugs and lettuce with a microscope? The answer is simple. They didn't do it because their mothers and grandmothers didn't do it. The tradition was that when you have a vegetable, you wash it to make sure it's clean. And if you don't see any bugs on it, it's kosher. And that's the end of it. Okay, you don't need salt water. You don't have to wash it five times. You don't have to examine it with a magnifying glass. You don't have to say the Jews can't eat um, uh, uh, broccoli anymore. Okay, if the broccoli looks clean. And asparagus. Eat, well, say what? And now, and now I'm hearing some places uh, they're going to asparagus as well. Yeah, asparagus is the one I was trying to think of. The, the broccoli as well. also works. <laughs> okay, so, so, so in other words, th this is a, a, a reaction where you try to recreate the tradition in writing after the living tradition has been destroyed. 
Uh, the other reaction uh, is radical. Okay, and this also happened after the Holocaust, not just in uh, religious ways. The other reaction is radical, and that is that after destruction and after catastrophe, you look for redemption. You try to redeem the world. And Jews after the Holocaust got, in, got a, you know, like a testosterone shot, okay, of trying to bring redemption to the world in many, uh, in many various uh, uh, ways. Avi. So this also happened in the wake of 1391 and 1492. And 16th century Luriana Kabbalah was the radical um, ideological or theoretical or philosophical, whatever you want to call it, reaction to the destruction of, uh, of life, of Jewish life in Spain. Avi? Yes. Uh, one, one reaction uh, that you haven't mentioned is uh, an anti-religious, anti-God, anti-faith reaction. Many survivors lost their faith. Okay. Or, or became, became, or Jews, or became Jews ethnically or uh, in terms of their identity, but lost their faith in, in, in Judaism as a, as in God, as a, as a redeemer. Yes. There are there are there are all kinds of of course reactions uh, to the Holocaust. Many of them uh, contradict each other, and they're in opposite uh, and they're in opposite ways. Um, some of the people who lost their faith after the Holocaust still look for redemption in other ways. Uh, I, I said that you know not, not all of the reactions were uh, were religious ones. Okay, so uh, to fight after the Holocaust to uh, to establish the state of Israel. Right, or to have your kids devote themselves to uh, to kun olam, rebuilding the world that we're going to talk about tonight. Even okay, um, th those are also uh, those are also reactions to uh, to destruction. So you're you're very uh, you're very correct there. Um, all right. So number five, what is Luria Enik Kabbalah? The first thing to know about it. Is that it seems to be in its in its in its in its in its base, the creation of a single person, okay, one person with radical new ideas that, well, once he expressed these ideas and they were you know and they were transmitted, they quickly conquered the entire uh, Jewish world. These ideas were the ideas of a man by the name of Rabbi Isaac, um, Rabbi Isaac Luria, a man who didn't even live a very long life. He died before the age of uh, 40. A man who wrote very little. He did write some things and we have some of them, but um, what he didn't write very much. It's his students that wrote down uh, his ideas as we'll talk about. Rabbi Isaac Luria wanted to redeem the world. Adan's point about how not all reactions are uh, traditional and reactions can be profoundly anti-traditional or anti-religious. We're going to see that that happened in a certain kind of a way, not the same way, but in a certain kind of a way that can be said of Shabbat Tzvi. And it's possible that the seeds of that are in the thought of Rabbi Isaac Luria, because this is a kind of Kabbalah that wants to take very concrete steps to redeem the world. Now, what is this? It is a brand new Kabbalistic uh, picture of the world and something that gives brand new meaning to keeping the practical mitzvot. In other words, if I said in earlier classes that Kabbalah was highly conservative, maybe I even used the word hyper-conservative, maybe I should have saved hyper-conservative for the Lurianic Kabbalah, okay? Because the Zoharic Kabbalah is very, very conservative, right? But, but this is like, you know, this is like, uh, 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 um, it's like uh, it's like uh, uh, it's like conservatism on on steroids, okay? 
this is um, we'll, we'll see we'll see as we go on how incredibly incredibly uh, uh, pedantic and uh, uh, and hyper conservative on the details of the mitzvot it was. So he left uh, an enormous uh, influence on his environment with this new picture, new meaning for the uh, mitzvot. He was born in Jerusalem, Rabbi Isaac Luria, but he was brought to Egypt and he grew up in Egypt. His father was an Ashkenazic Jew. He married a Sephardic uh, Jewess. And, and in 1570, shortly towards the end of his life, a few years before he died, two or three years before he died, he had a uh, vision, a, a revelation from God that he needed to make Aliyah to go up from Egypt to Tzfat. And he went to Tzfat in 1570, and he lived there until his death in 1572. He had an enormous impact on his environment in Tzfat, on certain people uh, around him. The, of the things that he did write, the best known are his piyutim, his liturgical poems for the three Sabbath meals. The, you know, mo most people today, they only hear it, if at all, in the third Sabbath meal. If any of you have ever gone to a synagogue on Saturday afternoon, and you had what's called in Yiddish, Shalash Sudis, right? The third uh, Sabbath meal, Sudash Tishi, in the synagogue, so sometimes the poem of Rabbi Isaac Luria for the third Sabbath meal is sung. I don't know if it rings a bell to anybody, okay? But uh, but that's that 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 the, those are the songs of his uh, that are known. He also has a fragmentary commentary on uh, parts of the uh, Zohar. But most of his point, most of his uh, ideas were spread by his students. The most important of which is uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital, who, uh, who mo the other transmitters of his thought, they're traditionally measured against Rabbi Chaim Vital. He seems to be the, 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 the model for Lurianic thought against which other, uh, other traditions of it are measured. Okay, now, last week we saw that Abraham Abu Lafia created the first public Kabbalistic scandal, okay? When it's a secret, it doesn't cause a ruckus. Rabbi Isaac Luria didn't cause a ruckus in the sense of Abu Lafia. He wasn't, he wasn't controversial in that sense. There weren't rabbinic leaders, you know, trying to expel him or, or shut him up or, or get him to be quiet or, or any, anything like that. On the contrary, the rabbinic leaders in his time, the, 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 the great halachists, the Talmudic scholars, they revered him, right? None other than Rabbi Yosef Karo, okay? Uh, the, 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 he, was greatly, uh, he was greatly respected and his ideas were recepted. But here's the catch. They were recepted on a mass level. They were spread to faraway lands and every single land that they went to they created a mass impact including on popular thought in other words i'm not saying i'm not saying don't get me wrong i'm not saying that 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 simple jews or unlearned jews studied uh, Lurianic Kabbalah. I'm not saying that. They didn't study it. And yet, the ideas in it, 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 its basic themes, resonated even with um, Jews who were, who were not so learned. They, they impacted the, the mass culture of Jews all around the world. Okay? The most vivid um, the most vivid um, the most vivid uh, uh, illustration of that, and this is true in, in any realm of Jewish thought, if you want to see whether, any, whether a certain wing of Jewish thought is influential, the, the question always to ask is, how does it impact on popular practice? If it impacts customs, if it impacts how Jews do the mitzvot, 
then you know that it didn't. Well, you know, there may have been these intellectuals who wrote about it and spoke about it, but it doesn't mean that it had a real, uh, a powerful resonance. Lurianic Kabbalah had an extremely popular resonance. And uh, even without, before we go on to other stuff, I think it's important to us to understand how powerful that resonance is, okay? Jews all around the world began adopting customs. Customs that were new customs, meaning they became customs, but they, they were unknown before that. Nowadays, today, we see them as customs because they've been around since the 16th century for 400 years already. 400 years sounds good for a custom, although in Jewish history, it's like last week, okay? And for instance, not long ago, we had the holiday of Sukkot. The seventh night of Sukkot, the night of Hoshana Rabbah. You've heard of the custom of staying up all night on Hoshana Rabbah and studying. I bet Kilata Karen at one point or another even had uh, activities uh, for, uh, for Hoshana Rabbah, okay? Now, I think most people in Kilat Akerem are not big on, uh, on Lurianic Kabbalah, probably. There may be a few who are interested, but it's probably not the main, the main business. And yet here, you know, you have a, a, Luria, you have a Lurianic custom. This custom didn't exist before the 16th century. A similar custom is the Night of Shavuot, which I, I must mention in a class for Kilat Akerem, because my connection with all of you in Kilat Takerem was created. You know, it happened through this custom of studying a night on Shavuot. And for, for many, many years already, Kilat Takerem has had this wonderful uh, activity year by year of uh, classes on the night of uh, Shavuot. And it's been an honor for me to be a part of it for at least uh, uh, some of it. And, um, and I'm glad it created the, uh, the, the connection uh, between me and the, uh, and the community. And that custom is a creation of Luriana Kabbalah. Okay, uh, Jennifer here has a question, yes? Okay. Well, well J Jennifer is asking a question that's gonna help me out tonight. Okay, she asks, for, for those on Zoom, she asks, you know, there's no internet, there's not even a New York Times. So how does this stuff get communicated over these vast areas to these distant lands uh, so quickly? Well, it didn't happen overnight, right? But it did get communicated in writing. It took people, most importantly, Rabbi Chaim Vital, but not only him, to, uh, to write down these ideas in a way that they could be comprehended. And then for these things to be mailed and copied, you know, mailed, you know, via camel or via a ship or, or whatever. And the writings get to distant lands. And these writings and ideas, they uh, make an impact. The great flowering of Lurianic Kabbalah, I mean, the flowering of it, or the, 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 yeah, the flowering of it is in the 16th century. But the great diffusion and impact is in the 17th century which helps me out a lot tonight because the 17th century is the century of Shabbatai Tzvi. Okay, in other words, Lurianic Kabbalah is the great wave that Shabbatai Tzvi rides. This wave, this giant wave is impactful in the 17th century. If you look at the dates of the people even, Okay, Shabbatai Tzvi roughly lives a century after Rabbi Isaac Luria. There's been a nice full century for all of these ideas to take root and become popular and become influential. It's possible that if Shabbatai Tzvi and the people who propped him up and, and made him famous it's possible that if all of them somehow had gone in a time machine and had lived the century before, maybe it wouldn't have worked. Okay, not just for that reason, but all, maybe also for this reason. 
that the, maybe a century before it wouldn't have worked. Why? Because these, these Lurianic ideas in the 16th century maybe hadn't fully saturated Yemen or, uh, or Poland or, uh, or wherever. Okay, they might have reached these places, but they might not have become a, a full part of the, of the outlook of Jews like they eventually became. Uh, Jennifer again, yeah. Yeah. It was well, right. It wasn't an overnight transformation, Jennifer is saying. There was a nice century for this to reach saturation and for the wave to reach its, you know, its, its greatest power, okay? just in time for our friend Shabtai Tzvi. That despite all of the historical reasons that made his movement powerful, they, they, they wouldn't have captured the Jewish world without this, uh, without this ideological wave. Okay, okay. The works of the students of Rabbi Chaim Bita, uh, of Rabbi Isaac Luria seem to be authentic representations of not only of what their teacher thought, but even what he said, even a lot of times, almost word by word transcriptions. Okay, they were very, very uh, uh, clearly and, uh, and carefully and uh, authentically uh, done. So now we need to explore what are these main ideas? What gives this way that And number two, we need to think about, are these ideas new and revolutionary or to what degree are these ideas new and revolutionary? And in, in Jewish thought, if you wanna know whether something is new and important, you always look at how much it's discussed, okay? If an idea is discussed a lot and people give it various definitions or various formulations or argue about what it means, then you know that it was a new idea. Because if it was a traditional idea, okay, then, um, then um, if it was a traditional idea, then it wouldn't merit such thought because every, uh, such discussion, because everybody knows what it is. It's only if there's something new and previously uh, unknown and everybody realizes that it's a chidush, it's, a, it's an innovation, then you need to discuss it and define it and argue about what it might, uh, what it might possibly mean. Okay. Now. I can't see you or hear you. He's frozen. Yeah. Oh dear. I'm not sure because I can see the flashing cursor, which implies that it's not frozen. What degree they were, uh, and to what degree they were new? Okay. Okay. So the three main ideas that we're going to study tonight, and I'll, I'll share my screen again, post disabled uh, participant screen sharing. Don, just let me share my screen. Don, do you hear me? Yeah, I needed to, re to make you co-host again, so. Okay. You're a co host, you're a co -host again. Okay, ah, now I can share my screen. Excellent. Okay, now you will again see, I believe, the, um, you will see the key points and you will go down to the main ideas. The first main, there are three main ideas and they are in English. They are in English. I'll write them here. Contraction. Shattering, and uh, we'll call it here repair, although there is a fancier word that I use below, okay? These are the three main ideas of Lurianic Kabbalah, and uh, we'll try to understand what they are and to what degree they are um, new ideas. 
The first is the contraction of the divinity. In Hebrew, tzimtzum, okay, in modern Hebrew, for those who know Hebrew or are learning Hebrew, you can say litzamtzem, okay? You can make something smaller. Litzamtzem hotzaot, not to spend as much money during the coronavirus, all right? Now, the idea of tzimtzum, of, of contraction of the divinity, the God either God turns within himself or God makes himself smaller, removes himself from a place. <clears throat> this idea derives from a basic question. The question is, we already know that the world of the spherot, all the universes, derive from the Ein Sof, from the infinite, from the Ayin, which is called nothingness because we cannot know it, not because it doesn't exist, right? The end self is infinite. That's what the term means. End self means there's no end. It's infinite. If God is infinite, then how is there a place for anything or anyone other than God? How is there a place for you or me? How is there a place for Kilat Karen or the state of Israel or even the entire cosmos? How can anything exist besides God if God is infinite and, and occupies every space? Now, it's possible to say that the answer is simply no. There isn't anything besides God. God is infinite and so there's nothing else. You can be this, you can say this in a pantheistic way. You can say that everything is really God, okay? That anywhere you look and anything you, you touch and anything that exists is really in and of itself an extension of God. All of nature is an extension of God. When we did Spinoza, we encountered uh, an idea that seems uh, eerily similar to this, okay? That's called pantheism that God is everywhere and everything is God and there is nothing besides God. That means that there is really no individuation, right? There is nothing, no individual thing or person that is really other than God. Another uh, way to look at this is what's called acosmism. Acosmism means that there is no cosmos. There is no universe, no physical universe. The physical universe is an illusion. It's not really there. And the only thing that's really there is God. This may remind you of ideas from uh, last, the West last week or two that um, in order to, uh, to, to have dvekut, to become close to God, you need to rid yourself of your, of your self, of your, of your ego, of your, uh, you know, your, 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 your personality. You need to make yourself nothing in order to become part of the real something, which is God. But the Lurianic idea is not a cosmism or pantheism. The Lurianic idea is that there must be another place besides God. How is that possible if God is infinite? Because the infinite in an act of will can make itself a little bit less infinite. It can contract itself and create a hollow space. You know, the ocean is very, very big. It's not infinite. But since the ocean is so vast that it almost seems infinite to us, we can use the ocean as an analogy. Imagine if the Pacific Ocean would contract itself just a little bit and leave in the midst of itself a bubble, in the middle of the water, a bubble, okay? That's maybe an imperfect analogy for God to contract himself and leave a little bubble of nothingness in his midst. That little bubble of nothingness is our cosmos, our universe. It is other than God because God made room for it. This is what Rabbi Yitzchak Luria calls tzimtzum. 
Now, now, this is different than the kind of Kabbalah we did before. In the Kabbalah of the Zohar, in the Kabbalah of the Zohar, the Ayin, right, the unknown God, the, the infinite God that cannot be known because, because it's infinite, because we're finite, that emanation, the, the, the Ayin, the Ayin, the nothingness, the, the, the nothing, nothingness, the, 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 the infinite God emanates and expands outward, okay? It's an act of expanding and growing. And from the ayin, from the ends of come, all of the tense we wrote, and all of it's only an expansion. In Lurianic Kabbalah, it's not just expansion. In fact, it begins with a moment of contraction. First, God contracts, and then God, so to speak, tries to touch the space, the empty space, okay? The, what, 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 the, what in the Zohar is this great expansion to the worlds of the Sfirot, here it's a contraction of God, and then God kind of reverses the contraction a little bit by trying to touch it, by trying to bring this world of the Sfirot into it. Okay, now. Okay, Avi. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure, Mary. How, how did they, um, uh, can't think of the word I want. How, <laughs> sounds familiar. Um, how did they um, find with the infinite God who is everywhere, how do they make that um, with the fact that he created all these things and he created man, plants, animals, and so forth, but they were not God, he created them. Okay, very nice, very nice. To, to take what you're saying and put it, put it into other words, traditional Jewish thought, like the creation story in the Bible, and for the most part, the, most of the rest of the Bible, rabbinic literature, fits better with duality, okay? When we sp studied Spinoza, we studied something which is a kind of monism. Spinoza says there is only nature, there is only one thing. That makes it very, very hard to reconcile traditional thought with Spinoza, okay? Mm -hmm. It's much easier to reconcile traditional thought with something which is a dualism. Why? Because in the Bible and in traditional Jewish thought, it's all based on relationships. Relationships are always between two people, right? You have two, and then you can have a relationship between them. If traditional thought is mostly about relationships, then it's more, gonna work much more easily with a kind of thought which is, uh, which is a, dual, a duality or which is a, a, a dualistic, okay? So, um, um, uh, now I'm trying to, ah, ah, so you brought up, uh, you brought up uh, creation. We're gonna talk a little bit about the creation story actually, okay? As we think about whether the, uh, the idea of, um, of Tsimtsum, whether it's a new idea or not, okay? How, how much is symptom of Rabbi Isaac Luri a new idea? I just want, for the sake of brevity and also to, to help people uh, know the terms, the IRI is the abbreviation for Rabbi Isaac Luria, okay? Adunenu Rabbeinu Yitzchak. And that abbreviation turns him into a lion, an IRI, right? And his students are called the Gure Ha'ari, the lion's cubs. Okay, it's, uh, you know, it's cute, but it also helps us talk about them a little bit more easily and with a little bit more color. So the Ari, the, uh, the Ari, he has this idea of Tsimtsum, of God's contraction into uh, himself. How new is the idea? In the previous Jewish tradition, was the idea of Tsimtsum used? And the answer is yes. For, in for instance, Chazal, 
the sages of Israel in the Midrash, they talk about how, you know, it says in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, it says in the Torah that God would speak to Moses in the tabernacle from between the two cherubs. Okay, the two cherubs were these two uh, golden images that were on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. So Chazal say, Tzim tzim et atzmo. Okay, God but I don't want to translate it uh, contracted because that's not really the meaning of Chazal. God concentrated himself, okay, between the two cherubs when he would talk to Moses. That is not what the Ari means, Rabbi Isaac Luria. It's a different meaning. Here you have a God who can be anywhere and is, or maybe he is even everywhere, but this God contracts himself, not contracts himself, concentrates himself in a certain place. Okay? This is obviously not Maimonides' God. Right? God concentrates himself in the tabernacle, over the Ark of the Covenant, or in Jerusalem, or in the land of Israel. God is best found in certain places and not in others. There are certain places which are, which are exceptionally holy. That's what Chazal meant. God concentrates himself in certain places, but it doesn't mean that God created a space without himself. It's a different meaning. In 13th century Kabbalah, you also have a, an idea of Tzimtzum expressed by none other than the Ramban, Nachmanides, who we talked about. The Ramban describes that Tzimtzum where God does, doesn't just emanate the 10 spherot. Rather, God breathes in the 10 spherot and then exhales the 10 spherot, breathes in spherot over and over again. We talked last week how a reality for how, how, how this is a living, breathing body, according to the Rambam. We talked about this in uh, previous classes. And here you have an idea of it, okay? The emanation is not a one-time thing. It's breathing in and exhaling, breathing in and exhaling all of, uh, all of the time. And yet with Rabbi Isaac Luria, it's not just that you breathe in or you breathe out. It's that you create a space where you are not. You contract yourself. It's not just a breathing <clears throat> in. And that's different even than the 13th century Kabbalah. Now, this, this, this contracting yourself, God contract, the divinity contracting itself to make a place without God. What is the mechanism for it? How does it happen? And the answer says the Ari is that it happens from din, from judgment. We saw, we saw this in 13th century Kabbalah, that you need on the one hand bounty, but you also need limits to the bounty. Too little is not too good, but too much is also not good, right? And um, it's good when these things are in balance, but when they're not in balance, deen or strictness or judgment is where evil comes from. Evil is built into the into the structure of reality according to 13th century Kabbalah. For the Ari in the 16th century, it's even more so. It's not that the Din is just one part of the spherot. Rather, Din works as a mechanism for the spherot to be emanated in the first place. In other words, Din or boundaries or strictness or the lack of God, okay, is part of the fundamental structure which gives rise to the spherot themselves. It's part of the primordial structure of, of, of existence, right, at the very basis of the spherot. Emanation itself needs boundaries. It's not that emanation gives rise to judgment. It's rather the judgment and limits are needed for emanation to happen the first happen in the first place. 
in, okay? For there be to be any individuation outside of God, God himself requires for that both emanation, bounty, and limits. Now, now, we'll see a text now which expresses this probably in terms very close to the words of Rabbi Isaac Luria himself. And when we do this text, I want you to think about not just or how, what it is and how original it, it is, but also where it might be taken, okay? This is from the writings of uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital, writing down the words of his teacher, probably in, in, in words very, very close to the way that Rabbi, that the Ari himself expressed them. And he says, and I will translate for you, Da, you must know, that the beginning of all, all of existence was just simple light. Light without various parts. You know that if you put light through a prism or prism light, you can see it divide into various colors. This is a light which is not complicated, it's not complex. And that simple, not complex light was called Ein Sof, called infinity, no boundaries. That's literally the meaning of Ein Sof, no boundaries. There was no empty space. Nothing more that we call nowadays outer space, no. But no space empty of God is what the arena is. When the emanator wanted, it rose in his will. This is not a, uh, this is a, like, the, like, like we had earlier in Kabbalah, this is a, um, a living being with a will. When the emanator decided that it wanted to emanate, for the reason which is known, right? The reason is not spelled out here in the quote, but it has to do with love. You can't love unless you have someone to give to. The az tzimtzem atzmo. Then he contracted himself into himself. Benishar chalal benatayim. And there arose an empty space within him. The same we, word we use in modern Hebrew for outer space. It's a perfect sphere. This emptiness is a perfect sphere. That's why the, the, the imperfect analogy I gave earlier of a bubble in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, okay? It's an imperfect analogy, but it fits the, the, the wording here. Right, the bubble is round. Perfectly round. Okay? So, the worlds that, that we know, they are inside this empty space. And the great light of God, the infinite God, that is all outside. It's surrounding this bubble, like the Pacific Ocean. When God contracted himself, as, God sent into this bubble of nothingness a thin, like a thread or a very, very thin channel. It's kind of like he poked the bubble, okay? He poked the bubble with this thin ray of light. And 
So this place of emptiness, of nothingness, which remained within the great vast light of God, nasa bichinat mikom chalala gul v'ashva'a, achat, that's uh, maybe a, a typo or repetition. Da ki b'makom hazeh netzar adam kadmon. Into this chala, this empty space, was emanated this term here, is very important, Adam Kadmon, primordial man, the primordial human being. The, it's kind of like the ultimate human being, the original human being, or the original model of the human being. If you remember from the 13th century Kabbalah, which has this idea in it, okay, the Sfirot themselves look like a human being. They look like a male, and then there's also a female, even down to the limbs of the body, okay? So if the Sfirot themselves look like a person, that might be the meaning of this term, Adam Kadmon. It's like the, 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 the model or image or, or root of the idea of a human being of which all of us are imperfect, um, imperfect, um, imperfect uh, uh, resemblances of it. Okay, so what is the what is Rabbi Chaim Vital saying in the name of the Ari? God wanted to put His light, or better, His lights, into this empty place to gift it with His lights. And those lights are the spherot. Those lights are this primordial human being. Okay? V'yeshbo mitziyut eser spherot. This Adam Kadmon has within it the ten spherot. Beheim mimalim kol hamakom hachalal hanizkar. And they fill up, their light fills this empty, uh, this empty space that is empty of God. This is God's gift to the empty space that he, uh, that he created. The text that I read from is called Durush Adam Kadmon, which explains in detail and in fairly clear language, as you saw, the whole process, the three-step process of which we've now seen step number one of Rabbi Isaac Luria's uh, uh, three steps in... Um, in his thought. We'll now see step two, okay? Which I don't have a, uh, a text for you, but we'll just talk, uh, we'll just talk a bit uh, about it, okay? Light expands infinitely. In order to stop light, you need to contain it, okay? Let's say you install lights in your home very powerful bulbs and it's, it's too much. It blinds the eye, the eye. What you need is, is a shade around it, right? Light needs to be, light needs to be uh, 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 contained. So, so what you have here is, what you have here is that God delivers this light in a vessel, maybe in a channel, like, like you said in the paragraph, that, uh, that we read. And yet the vessels are not strong enough. They're not, uh, they don't, they're not appropriate enough to contain this light. And the vessels carrying the light shatter. It's like the light shade bursts into flames, okay? And you need to think about what this means. What this means is that when God creates the, the world, God fails, right? God's intention to make an other, an individuation other than God's self, and then to gift it with God's light, this intention fails. The light is too much, okay? Now, when that happens, you ask yourself, what? You go back to Marion's question about the story of creation in the Torah. We normally think, and this is the traditional Jewish way to think, <laughs> among others, we normally think that how is God different than a person in the most, uh, in the most uh, human way? 
human beings, they want to do things. Human beings have all kinds of intentions and they try to realize their intentions. But always with human intentions, the fulfillment is somewhat different. Sometimes you just fail abysmally and there's nothing or it's even worse than it was before. Sometimes you succeed, sometimes you even have great success. But even the greatest success is never perfectly like the way that you had intended. Whereas God simply intends and does. God says, let there be light. And what's the result? It's there light. is light. Exactly what God intends, that is what happens. In traditional Jewish thought, we see God as the one for whom there is no gap between what God intends and what God actually does. That gap is a sign of humanity, of human frailty, of human limitations. And but not for God. When we come to the, the Kabbalah of the Ari, we see that God intends, but God, like a person, does not fully realize his intentions. He tries to create this beautiful world full of light and the light explodes, okay? Is there any previous notion of this in the Bible, in rabbinic thought? Perhaps, okay? One possible, one possible uh, 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 um, predecessor for this way of thinking is that there's a famous midrash, which probably some of you have heard, that says that before the creation of the world, God would create worlds and destroy them. In other words, what this midrash depicts God in, in a very human way, right? A human being is trying to make something, you know? So you build it the first time, doesn't work. You build it the same, then you take all the parts apart and you try it again, and you try it again, and you try it again until you finally succeed, okay? That Midrash too portrays God, and not as that just this perfection that he says that it is, but rather a God who's trying to, who struggles to overcome the imperfections of his previous creations and finally reach a creation that, that works. Okay, so there may be some previous notion of what, what Rabbi Isaac Luria says. And yet, as a whole or, or in general, it is not such a traditional idea. Okay, to say that God's act of creation contained within it failure. Okay. The story of uh, Noah. Yeah. <laughs> You don't need a midrash. You don't need a midrash. Well, God's great failure in the Bible is with people. He creates a perfect world with the Garden of Eden, right? But where God is always disappointed is in his relationship with human beings, right? Like Abraham, Joshua, Heschel, God in search of man. Man is turning his or her back on, uh, on God. So you, so you, in that sense, Mary, and I agree with you that you do have that, uh, that you do have that in the, uh, in the Bible, okay? In the Zohar, by the way, the Zohar uh, does have uh, some ideas like this. There's a list in Genesis that we read in the synagogue, and for people, it's like kind of boring. It's a list of all the kings who arose in Edom, right? That, that you have uh, Isaac's son, uh, Esav, and uh, the father of Edom and all of his descendants and all of the kings. So the Zohar, who sees that uh, Esau as the, the, the satanic uh, side of things, he, uh, the Zohar can, considers all of these kings to be simply symbolic representations of the worlds that, uh, the, the, the God's failures in, in attempts to emanate. Okay, so there is background to this idea of the Ari. Okay, two scholars of the Kabbalah, Tishbi and Shalom, they describe creation as childbirth. 
But that's what the IV means. Think about childbirth. Childbirth is a wonderful act of creation, but it's also very, very messy and very <laughs> painful and uncomfortable at times. Okay? At times, always. Okay, I was, I was corrected here. Okay, always. Okay, and um, you know, when the baby is born, not just the baby comes out, other things come out too that the mother's body needs to uh, uh, rid itself of. Okay, and, uh, and maybe in that sense, okay, the world, just like a baby that's born needs to be cleansed, maybe the world that is born needs to be cleansed of its filth. The, the world was born also with evil, also with this din, this boundary, this strictness that makes the emanation possible. Okay, um, so evil in this sense is very, very real and it derives from God, okay? It's part of God's either emanation in the Zohar or even the very structure that allows for emanation in the uh, Kabbalah of the Ari. In the Kabbalah of the Ari, it comes from also from the Zohar, you have these ideas of God's long face, patience, kindness, God's short face, the, 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 the quick temper, okay? Uh, the, the, these things find expression in those very songs that I mentioned, the three songs that the Ari wrote for the three uh, Sabbath meals. Also, finally, um, the act is almost complete. God finally when Adam sins. Okay, and that kind of fits a little bit with what uh, others, Jennifer and Miriam, said that, right, uh, that. Um, you know, God does create the world as it should be, but then things are set wrong by, um, by humanity. Although Adam sinning, of course, is interpreted in the realm of the uh, spirit. So we have two central ideas so far, God's contraction into himself, the shattering of the vessels when God tries to send his light into the empty space that is other, other than himself, Instead of filling the space with light, the lights are shattered and they're hidden in the, in the shards of uh, the vessels that tried to contain them. And finally, we get to rectification or tikkun. Rectification or tikkun. Here we have very practical consequences. First of all, we have a very big problem. God, so to speak, has been shattered, right? Those lights that God sent into the empty space were the lights of God. They're parts of God. They're, so to speak, the limbs of God. They've been shattered. They've been, these organs have been severed from God. What you gonna do, right? God has been shattered. God is no longer one where parts of God have been exiled from God. Parts of God have been exiled from himself. The job of human beings in, in Lurianic Kabbalah are to return these sparks to their source. And in that sense, God becomes dependent on human beings. This reminds us of the theurgy that we did in earlier Kabbalah, right? That human beings have the potential to put the spirot into balance, okay? Um, but here we're going to see that it becomes much more concrete. Okay, what are the tools which we, as people, as human beings, can use to rectify this terrible situation that God has been shattered and parts of God are exiled from God the tools that we use to rectify the situation are the mitzvot. And think about, by the way, how we do the mitzvot. We do the mitzvot with our bodies, right? We do actions with our hands and our feet and our lips and our tongues. We do physical actions. These physical actions redeem sparks that have to do with parts of the body of God, okay? There's a correspondence going on. 
uh, there's a correspondence uh, uh, going on. So, so not only do the, do the mitzvot, are they done with limbs of the body, the mitzvot also purify the human within, you know, they purify the soul, okay? And this can also influence God on certain levels. In other words, when you do the mitzvah, you don't just do the action, you also do it with a kavana, with an intention. And those intentions which you have in your soul, they also have an impact on this situation of the uh, light of God that has been uh, shattered. Now these sparks are everywhere in the world. Rabbi Chaim Vital, he described his teacher, the Ari, as a person who saw everything as alive and breathing. Every plant, every animal, every building, every stone, the sun and the moon and the sky, everything is alive, the clouds, everything is alive and breathing. Meaning that there are sparks of life, sparks of divine light everywhere, okay? All of these things are, are parts of God. All of these are sparks that can be redeemed if human beings do the mitzvot with the right kavanot. And what is the purpose of all of this? What is the purpose of elevating all of these sparks to their source? Well, let's think about it. Part of God was sent into this dark, ungodly universe. It exploded and it shattered. And there's lots and lots and lots and lots of scattered sparks. Imagine that every spark that you elevate, you've made God a little bit more whole. You've You've redeemed another little part of God from exile. And you've taken one more little step and then another and then another towards bringing the, the bringing existence back to, way that it, the, to the way that it should have been. In other words, every single mitzvah, every single action, every single good kavanah, Every single spark that's elevated by, by a Jew, perhaps even by a non-Jew, okay, brings God a little bit back to himself, reduces the exile a little bit. It's another small step towards the redemption. In other words, in the wake of the exile from Spain and in the wake of other great tragedies, okay, that we'll talk about. Um, the world is so catastrophic, but we're not helpless. We have a way to repair the world through doing the mitzvot with the Lurianic covenant. So you see the messianism that's even within the thought of the whole thing. The whole thought, all of the things that we talked about tonight, they're there in order to redeem the world. Now, the main redemption, uh, to redeem existence. Now, the main redemption of existence here is the redemption of God himself, okay? And yet, there is a parallel in this world. The parallel in this world is that there will be a messianic figure, a messianic king, who will rebuild Jerusalem and ingather the exiles and all of the kinds of things that we've, uh, that we've talked about. Everything that happens that we see in this world in the redemption is just a pale reflection of the great redemption that's happening in other realms as God himself returns from exile, as the sparks are gathered to their source. So when the Ari talked about tikkun olam, the olam he was talking about is not poverty in the third world, okay? The olam he's talking about is the real world, meaning the divine world. That's the world that he's trying to rectify or to, um, or to uh, uh, repair. 
Now, is this a new idea? Tikkun olam, to repair the world. The answer is no, not entirely. Okay, we have this for instance in the Mishnah. The Mishnah talks about various rules which were instituted okay, to, in order to rectify the world. Okay, litaken olam. What's an example? You'll see how incredibly far this is from Liliana Kabbalah. One of the examples in the Mishnah has to do with a, a, a man who's in a very difficult situation. It's bad to be a slave, okay? But it's even worse to be half slave. What does it mean to be half slave? It's actually a very simple economic proposition. Two people buy a slave. And then one of them frees the slave. In other words, he frees his half. Okay, and there's even discussions of this in the Talmud, like, you know, like you divide the days of the week. He has to work on Sunday for one master, but he's free on Monday for himself. Okay, because one master freed him and one master uh, didn't. They were uh, partners. But what is the real tragedy here with a half slave? Why is it more tragic to be half a slave than a full slave? Because you can't marry. Okay, if he was free, he could marry a free woman. And if he was a slave, he could marry a slave woman. But if he's half free and half slave, he can't marry anybody at all. Okay, <laughs> so the Mishnah says that in order the taken olam, okay, in order to, uh, for, for the fixing of the world, the, the, the master who still owns half is forced to free his half. The slave may have to pay him, pay him back. That, 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 that's, these things are discussed, right? But the, the master is forced to free the slave so that the slave can marry. And letaken olam there means like to settle the world. The world is meant to be settled. People are meant to be married and to have children. And that won't happen if this poor man is left in a situation where he's half free and he's half uh, a slave. So the phrase exists in Chazal, but the meaning is very different because it's a this worldly meaning. This world has to be repaired. People in this world can't be left in this limbo status of half slave and half free. But for Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, it turns into the taken olam, it's the world of the divinity. It's to gather up the, the, the uh, sparks it's to gather up the sparks of, uh, of God. Okay. Now, this has a meaning, as probably a lot of you are aware, you know, ideas, they go through these different uh, reincarnations, these different uh, Gilgulim, and you have Tikkun Olam today. You have a, uh, a, a journal called uh, Tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N, which uh, some, are, some of you have met, met, may have read. Tikkun magazine. It's a left-wing uh, magazine devoted to social justice. And who are the people who uh, publish a magazine like that? These are Jews who, because they come from the Jewish tradition, they want to prepare the world, right? It's because of where I come from. It'd be, I, I take upon myself this universal obligation towards uh, all, of, uh, all of humanity. It can be a very uh, secular thing, although it definitely doesn't have to be. It can also be a very spiritual or even religious uh, thing in, in various, uh, in various uh, 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 different ways. And so you see here how a term which exists in Chazal to repair the actual world that we live in, for Rabbi Yitzchak Nuria becomes reified and, and literally deified to be talked about uh, repairing the sparks of God. And then it comes back down to earth again, okay, in these, uh, in these Jewish versions of, uh, of, social, uh, of social justice uh, movements, okay, and this kind of uh, universal uh, humanistic uh, Judaism. Okay, okay. But this is acute messianism. Messianism. Every single time you do a mitzvah, you're not just doing a mitzvah. You're bringing the Messiah closer. 
and you see Jews around you doing mitzvot and they're bringing the Messiah closer. And maybe this is part of the reason why Durian and Kabbalah spread so much and became so much of the aura of Jews. Imagine for yourself a simple Jew in Yemen who wasn't so brilliant, wasn't so educated. You know, the, the Chacham wasn't going, or the Mari, they call it in Yemen, wasn't going to teach Luriana Kabbalah to this Jew on the one hand. But on the other hand, to tell this Jew that every single mitzvah that you do elevates a spark of God and brings the Messiah closer, that is something you can tell even to a simple Jew. And even if the simple Jews weren't told, they could pick up on this idea. It's not that hard an idea to understand it on a simple level. You don't need, a, you don't need all of tonight's discussion, right, to, to get this, right? If all of you had like, you know, begun class tonight, and I just said that, you know, in Luria and Kabbalah, every single mitzvah that you do makes the Messiah closer, you would get that, right? You don't have to be a deep Kabbalist uh, in order to uh, get that. This is something that provided meaning to Jews of all levels of education, all strata of society. It gave meaning to the finest, smallest elements of their lives. Every single mitzvah, every single kind word, every penny to, uh, to charity, every word of every prayer, right? every ounce of matzah on Pesach, okay? All of these things bring the Messiah closer. And we're doing so many mitzvot, so many Jews all around the world. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like the, that the Messiah must be, uh, must be in, a, in, a, in a very fast car with very good horsepower, right? We're revving that engine, right? You know, we're pushing down on the gas pedal. We're bringing the Messiah here at 90 miles an hour, okay? And this, the, 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 just the concept that, that, that all of this brings home makes Jews looking, look for the Messiah around the corner all the time. They're always thinking of it and they're always trying to achieve it. And they're seeing so many mitzvot done that it must be charging super fast on a super highway on its way here. The only question is how many kilometers does it have left? And even if it, by the way, has lots of kilometers, you can cut it down by doing more mitzvot and more mitzvot and more mitzvot and making the car go, uh, go even faster. So, so the, the writings that came out of all of this from the 17th century on, and the 17th century is the century of Shabtai Tzvi, are all of these manuals to kavanot, to intention. How exactly to think when you do this mitzvah, that mitzvah, and especially, especially prayer, down to the very word, down to the very letter, very complicated kavanot, books about these kavanot, how to have kavanah for every letter in the prayer. And Kabbalistic prayer would take a very, very long time for the Kabbalists, right? If they have to have all of these uh, intentions on, uh, on every single letter. But even regular Jews, even regular Jews imbibed this idea that doing mitzvot redeems the sparks of God. Now what we need to do before our time is up is try to do, to, to look in the opposite direction. So far we've been saying, what are these three ideas of contraction and then shattering and then uh, repairing, okay? So far we were saying, what are these three ideas and where did they come from? How traditional are they or how new and, 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 and original are they? Fine. Now what we need to do is try to think, where might they lead, okay? Let's take the first idea, the contraction of God. God contracts himself in a necessary act of 
contraction, to make room for the world. That's how God creates. And the world is a place without God into which God sends his light. True enough, yes. And yet, this act of contraction, of moving away from God, of not being part of God, of God removing himself, okay, is a necessary part of the world that we live in. Where might that idea go? Think about what it means. What, uh, Jennifer's saying what again? Jennifer says it replaces responsibility on human beings. That might be true to, to redeem the sparks and so on and so forth. But even before we get to the shattering, the very idea that God contracts himself in a necessary act of part of the act of creation, this means that removal from God is part of existence or even part of God himself. Evil. God himself. This already has a basis in 13th century Kabbalah, but there it was a business of balancing the spherot, and you can balance them out, and you can make everything nice. Here we're saying, even if it balances, that's not going to solve the problem. Because for God to emanate at all, you need to have this evil contraction, this removal from God. Okay? Rabbi um, Nachman of Braslav, we're going to see that Hasidut is a development of, uh, of Lurianic Kabbalah, which is also why the opponents of the Hasidim saw it as being a heretical uh, extension of Shabbat Tzvi. We're going to talk more about this when we get up to it. Um, but uh, Rabbi Nachman of Braslav said that Heresy is a reflection of tzimtzum. How can you have people in the world who don't believe in God, who don't see God, who don't know God, who find God absence? How can heresy or disbelief or, or atheism, how can it even exist in a, word, in a world suffused with God's light? Answer is, God himself contracted himself. In other words, God created atheism. God created the lack of God, the lack of holiness. Or to make it even more direct, you could say that God created evil. Or even that evil is part of God. Okay? Okay of Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is a necessary part of God's living and breathing. Tzimtzum is evil. Tzimtzum is a removal of God, okay? Or at least the, the basis for evil. And so this gives evil a very prominent place as well as disbelief, okay? And I'm not going to say that Sabbatianism was disbelief. It very much was not, okay? And yet, and yet, just think about it. If you want to go against the Torah, you can now justify it in terms of God himself. And that's only the first point. That's only the tzimtzum, the contraction. What happens when we get to the shattering of the lights? Not where it came from and what it is, but where might that lead us? Where might that take us? What might be the, the implications of this? Anybody? Injury, God explodes. When there's explosion, there are injured people. Okay, but think about what it means. You need to elevate the sparks up to God, back to God. The sparks are hidden in the shards of the vessel which could not contain them. They are hidden in shards of evil. They are hidden in places where God 
is not to be found. You might in the end find a little spark of God in it, but you've got to go to the places where God is not visible, where God isn't found usually, okay? This could justify, uh, I wish somebody would just say it, I wish you'd come up with it on your own, <laughs> right? This could theoretically be used as a justification for sin, okay? Or for at least for, for what nominally uh, is called or traditionally is called or considered sin. Okay? It could be a, a justification for it. The sparks of God are found everywhere, even within, within evil. And you have to go, go to that evil in order, to, uh, in order to redeem them. Let's go to the last one. I think the last one is the most dangerous of all. Usually people can take Sabbatian, talk about Sabbateanism, okay? And, they, they, and when they, have, they try to show how it's based on Luriana Kabbalah, usually the focus is on number two, on the shattering, right? That, you know, the, the sparks are contained within the shards of the evil, what we just said. But you can also attach it to number three. Number three is to repair the world, okay? Every mitzvah, every spark is crucial to bringing the redemption closer. And the more mitzvot that you do, the faster the redemption is a coming. In what strange, well, maybe not strange to us at least, in what unexpected direction could that be taken? Anybody? Sexual uh, promiscuity. Promiscuity. I, I see you've read a little bit about Shabtai Tzvi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't want to go to the specific act of promiscuity yet. Okay. But first of all, think how, like I, I use the, 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 the weird analogy, okay? The, the, the redemption is coming in a high-speed car. Right? Well, maybe you want to develop a new kind of car. But first of all, first of all, maybe you need to speed it up even more. Maybe you need to find a new kind of gasoline, a new kind of fuel. Maybe you need jet fuel in that car, okay? You need a totally different vehicle. The flux okay? capacity. To, to speed up, uh, you know, one mitzvah and one spark and another mitzvah and another spark, it's not fast enough. It's not powerful enough, okay? Maybe you need a different vehicle to make it come. Not the traditional mitzvot, but something else. That's number one. And number two, and this is the really cool thing, okay? What happens when the redemption actually comes. We talked about this maybe in some of the earliest classes on Messianism, okay? There is an antinomian uh, danger built into the very idea of redemption, okay? Remember that the Torah is meant for an imperfect world. Remember we discussed this? The Torah is meant for an imperfect world. In what kind of world do you need the Ten Commandments? In a world like ours. It's an imperfect world, so you got to tell people uh, do not murder and stuff like that. Okay? But in a perfect world, would you need the Ten Commandments? No. Nope. You wouldn't need them anymore. Right? There's this idea, to a certain degree, even in traditional texts. In Chazal, you, find, you can find hints of this. Okay? You, you have this idea that the Torah may not be fully applicable, at least, when the redemption comes. When the redemption comes, things will change. We saw that Maimonides went to war against this idea, and he said, no, even when the Messiah comes, it'll be just according to the Torah, and the, the, the Messiah will make everybody follow the Torah. 
Well, Maimonides can say that, and yet that is not what everybody thought. It's very natural to think that when the redemption comes and when the world is perfect, that maybe there will be a different kind of Torah. Okay, so once you say that, you know, that the Messiah is speeding on his way, or maybe even that the Messiah is already here, then you have the potential again for antinomianism, for a behavior that is utterly different than the tradition, despite the ultra-conservative tendencies of, uh, of uh, Kabbalah. You might want to also use the highway analogy, the, the speed car on the highway, well, maybe the highway isn't the same thing the whole way, okay? Maybe you get to a point, you know, where there's a toll booth. Or maybe you get to a point where there's speed bumps. Or maybe you get to a point where, you know, you have to do different things in order to, uh, to be able to arrive at your destination. Maybe the closer the Messiah gets, the different kinds of, the more different our actions in Kavanot have to be, Okay, in order to get him over that last kilometer or two. Okay, and so you can take this in radically, radically, radically um, uh, different and surprising and unusual directions, which we will see actually happened with, um, with uh, Shabbatai, with Shabbatai Tzvi. Now, Shabbatai Tzvi himself was aware of uh, Lurianic Kabbalah. We're not going to do his life story now. There's not time. We'll do it next time. But just in terms of the ideas that we talked about tonight, he was aware of Lurianic Kabbalah simply because nobody in the 17th century, no Jewish person at least, could be unaware of the Lurianic Kabbalah. And yet he himself was not so into Lurianic Kabbalah. He apparently got a good Jewish education. He was an educated Jew. He was also a very, uh, you know, he was a learned Jew. He wasn't, a, wasn't a, you know, he, he was a smart guy. Okay, he was a bit of a scholar. He studied Kabbalah, but it turns out that he mostly studied Zohar. Okay, he studied the old fashioned Kabbalah of the 13th century. So how does he ride on the wave in that case? When I started this class with, you'll ask me, I was totally wrong, you'll say. How does he ride the wave of the giant powerful wave of Lurianic Kabbalah and a surfboard if he wasn't so into Lurianic Kabbalah? The answer is that it was not he who launched his career. Somebody else launched his career for him. Okay, as we'll talk about next week, I'm just going to give you a few like uh, uh, sparks, okay, for what's going to be next week. That uh, the, 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 the Shabtai Tzvi had an agent, okay, like an actor who has an agent. He had an agent, and this agent was the person who said that here, the, the Shabtai Tzvi is the figure, right, who can ride the wave of Lurianic Kabbalah and be the uh, Lurianic, uh, Lurianic uh, Messiah. Okay, this is Nathan of Aza. We'll talk about him next week. Uh, we'll talk about him next week too. Now, just to complete the background, I'll tell you one more historical thing and then we'll, we'll finish. The exile of the Jews from Spain was traumatic and catastrophic, like, I, like we talked about in the beginning of class. And yet in the 17th century, it was already several generations behind, okay? It was still traumatic, it was still catastrophic. And many of the people who were followers of Shabtai Tzvi, by the way, were descendants of exiles from Spain, descendants of people who, for whom the Jewish tradition was not concrete because it had been broken. The chain of tradition by them had been broken. So the exile from Spain was very important. It was something, it was a catastrophe from which people were looking, for, um, were looking for redemption. And yet it wasn't the only catastrophe. It was the only, it was the catastrophe that pre preceded the Rihanna Kabbalah. But if we're gonna start talking about Shabtai Tzvi now in the 17th century, 
during the lifetime of Shabtai Tzvi, there was another great catastrophe, which had a big impact on him and which was maybe another wave, not, a, not an ideological wave, but an historical wave which, which, which the movement rode, rode. And that was what's called in Hebrew, Gzerot Tach V'tat, the, the massacres, the pogroms of 1648 and 1649, better known as the Chmelnitsky massacres in Ukraine. Okay? Okay, I, I don't know how to spell Chmelnitsky in English. Probably you know how in Russian. In uh, a CHM something Chmelnitsky. Uh, Jennifer asked how to spell it. You can, you can Google it and find out. But the Chmelnitsky massacres, the Chmelnitsky massacres, they brought a sense of trauma to the European Jewish world that that was, was more recent and more vivid than the exile of the uh, Jews of Spain, okay? So tonight we had a lot of, um, a lot of ideological background, a lot of, 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 of ideas in the background, also a bit of historical background. We'll do more historical background next time. And tomorrow, next, next week, We'll get into the story of Shabtai Tzvi, okay? And maybe if we're lucky, we'll also get into the repercussions of Shabtai Tzvi. But I hope at a minimum next week that we'll at least have enough time to do the story. Okay? So we'll stop here. If people have questions or uh, responses, there's still time because people were very, very quiet for the most part uh, tonight. Um, anybody? Not at the moment. Okay. Jennifer says that she's going to review the concepts for uh, next week. Um, if that's all, we'll, uh, we'll stop here. Okay. Thank you. I put the spelling in the chat, but I misspelled it. The letter I should be a letter L. Okay. Yeah, I thought I was something wrong. Yeah. What? Mary and I missed it. Mm -hmm. I missed what you said. Okay, so everyone have a, a good, healthy, pleasant, successful week. Thank you. Next you too, week. Abby. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. See you next week. Good brain exercise. <laughs>